Near the town of Parsons, Darkie Snob is a land that is nearly impassable. It has stories of the Underground Railroad, slaves, and ghosts. According to the legend, Darkie Snob was an intricate part of the Underground Railroad, where slaves who lost hope found it again with a dangerous passage through Darkie Snob. Hiding during the day so they weren't discovered, they risked everything for freedom, even endangering their lives. A cabin hidden at Darkie Snob virtually undetectable by people passing by, became a beacon of hope for a young slave girl as she sought freedom from the life of a slave. According to the legend, the slave girl missed the cabin in the night and rode her horse to the top of Darkie Snob. Since she was being pursued by slave catchers, she turned around to see how far away they were. As she did, the horse lost its footing and they both plunged to their deaths towards the Cheat River below. Supposedly on the anniversary of her death, you can still hear her scream. I first became interested in the story of Darkish Knob when I found it online while searching for local ghost stories. A legend took place around my hometown of Parsons, West Virginia, but there was no place that I knew of called Darkish Knob. So this started a quest to find this elusive location. So where was this Darkish Knob? After asking around, I was given a location. It is called Darkie Knob or Darkie Snob by the locals and stands looming above the Cheat River across from the small community of Holly Meadows. Its sides covered in loose bedrock and steep inclines. Now since I found the location of this mountain, it was clear that reaching the top was going to be more difficult than I thought. So I continued asking around to find an easy way to reach the top of Darkie Snob. And finally, a local man gave me directions to reach Old Darkie safely. So on April the 10th, 2012, me and my best friend Shell made the quest to reach Darkie Knob. It took about two hours of hiking old log roads and rough terrain to reach the top of Darkie Knob. But once there, it was an astounding sight. You can easily see the community of Holly Meadows and in the distance, my hometown of Parsons, West Virginia. As we explored, it soon became evident on how steep the mountain was and how a slave woman could easily fall to her death from Darkie Knob. We spent most of the day filming, but it was soon realized we'd have to come back to try to find the cabin foundation on the backside of Darkie as I was told by some locals that the remains of the foundation were still there. On my second attempt to find actual proof of the legend, I went to Darkie Knob alone. It was a little unsettling as I wasn't sure where to look for the cabin and I thought of something going wrong was constantly in the back of my mind. Once again, I was at the top of Old Darkie and it was peaceful and calm. So on my descent to the back of Darkie Knob, I kept hitting old log roads that would begin and end and I have to slide down to the next one, making a zigzag pattern down the mountain. But as I reached the bottom, and with no sight of the cabin foundation, I felt I needed to leave. With all the information I had at the time, I created my first video, The Legend of Darkish Knob. Many who have lived around the mountain have claimed to have heard screams and talked about strange things happening on and around the mountain itself. But how much of this is true or can be explained by a mountain lion screaming or an overactive imagination or rocks falling off the side into the river below? But the most important question is where did this legend originate and who was this so-called slave woman?
Before we get into the origin of the legend, we must first realize a few things. The Underground Railroad was a network of secret routes and safe houses used by enslaved blacks before and during the Civil War. This escape network was not literally underground nor a railroad. It was figuratively underground in the sense of it being an underground resistance. The term Underground Railroad gained currency in the 1830s as northern abolitionists became more vocal. Mostly a northern phenomenon, it operated mainly in the free states above the Mason-Dixon line and Ohio River, and was run by northern free blacks, Native Americans, white abolitionists, and church clergy. Conductors, as they were called, led or transported the fugitive slaves from station to station. Slaves traveled mostly at night, about 10 to 20 miles to each station. They rested and then a message was sent to the next station to let the station master, one who took care of and hid the slaves, know that runaways were on their way. Routes were often purposely indirect to confuse slave catchers and to reduce the risk of infiltration many people associated with the Underground Railroad knew only their part of the operation. By the end of the Civil War, on December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution outlawed slavery, and thus this ended the need for the Underground Railroad. As for any history on the Underground Railroad here in Tucker County, I did hear of a farmer who supposedly helped with smuggling slaves from his farm on Blackman Flats, which is coincidentally connected to Darky Knob. But I cannot find any historical information to back up this claim. The only thing I can find out about Blackman Flats is that it is named for a land baron, David Blackman, who was noted for his social qualities and honest dealings with his fellow man. He was opposed to the institution of slavery, but having received from his father-in-law a few slaves as a gift to his wife, he kept them and their issue until the commencement of the war. He was noted for always refusing to sell any of them. So I guess we must leave the speculation of Darkie Snob being a route for the Underground Railroad to our imaginations, or until we can find historical documentation to prove otherwise. But why is it called Darky Snob and not Darky Snob in the legend? Where did this legend originally come from? What I found out intrigued me, but also let me know much of our history was lost or retold to the extent that only fragments of truth remained. After completing my first video, a woman named Eleanor Nestor contacted me. In her email she wrote, In 1967, when I was at Fairmont State College, I had Dr. Ruth Ann Music as an English professor. One of our assignments was to go to our home counties and write up folklore or ghost stories. Fred Long was in his 70s at the time and lived in the first house on the right. Going down First Holly Meadows Road told me the story of Darby Knob. He was a well-known and well-educated man and told me the story as if he believed it to be true. The mountain was across from his house and farmland. So I wrote the story down for my assignment. More than 10 years later, I found out that Dr. Music had published this story and three others I had done in her book, Coffin Hollow and Other Ghost Tales. She had apparently changed the name of Darky Knob to Darkish Knob, perhaps in an attempt to be more politically correct. Eleanor Harper Nestor. Thanks to Eleanor and Dr. Music's work, the legend of Darkish or Darky Knob came to light, and now through today's media it was broadcast to the world. But if Fred Long believed the story to be true, then there has to be some record of the event. This question brought to me another fact that my friend Roxanne Bright brought to my attention when I finished my first video. 
In Pansler's History of Tucker County, on page 192, there is a footnote stating how Darky Knob received its name. So named for a slave woman, Jenny Walker, who was riding a mule along this hill and carrying a child in her arms. The mule slipped, throwing her down the steep incline where she caught into a bush, holding to it with one hand and unto the child with the other. Her screams were heard in the holly meadows and she and the child were both rescued. Darky was the general term used in reference to a slave. This was the first time I heard the name of the slave woman who fell from Darky Knob. On my quest to find historical information on the legend, I came across some friends who pointed me in the direction of a resident of Holly Meadows named Leonard Arnold. My friends knew him as a good neighbor and trusted friend. So after many attempts at getting together for an interview, I was able to get Mr. Arnold's take on the legend. What did you hear about Darky Knob? Well, I heard there was a colored girl and she was going back they used to have a logging train run out back here behind the holler and they said that she was going there to meet that train to go to Pennsylvania. And a horse slid on them and cliffs of rock right over there and she fell over the cliff and they said you could hear her screaming. But that's what they said happened. And they used to be slaves would go there and get on that train and they would take them to Pennsylvania. Okay, because uh According to Fan Source History of Tucker County, it was a Jenny Walker. She was riding a mule at, with a baby in her arms. The mule lost its uh, footing and it fell over the side of the hill over here. And she held onto a bush with the baby in her arms and her screams were heard in Holly Meadows. And that's why they called it Darky well, Knob. Walker used to live up above Hinchcliffe there, back up the holler. He lived there with Phoebe Helmet. And he's one of the old Walker clan, but he's been dead for, oh, I guess, hmm, he's been dead around 35, 40 years. Wow. Yep. See, Sonny Hedrick got the farm. Okay. When Phoebe died, it was left to him. And his people, Walker's people came here and got him and took him back with them. I think it was up in Pennsylvania or someplace they went. Okay. And that's the last I ever heard of him. I don't know, people who talk about ghosts, yeah, I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in one ghost, the Holy Ghost, that's the only ghost I believe in, you know. But uh, I've heard people talking about seeing things. Well, up there on that no at night, up on that ridge, mm -hmm. people said they seen lights up there. Well, I sat out there on my back porch and I seen lights up there, but there were stars after a while. Yeah. They would come above the tree line. Right. But the forest seen anything. I've never seen anything, never heard anything. Rocks sliding off over there and stuff, you know, but as far as hearing anything like other than that, I've never heard anything. So no screams? Or... No, <laughs> no. I've heard the foxes fighting over there and the coons and <laughs> stuff like that and hoot owls and screech owls. And, and like I said, I've been down here since 1982. Um, talk a little bit, do you know any more about the logging that went up through there or anything? Or? The uh, only thing I know is what Alan said, they used to have a train run clear back up around, it went clear back up around into Mackeyville. And this went clear down in, come out down there, slip hill and went around there and went clear into lead mine. And they used to haul the logs out down through there on trains. That's how they got them out. And uh, they say, I have never seen it, but they say back there in that hauler back there, there's still some foundation of the old shanty used to be back there. Okay. Now it's uh, now the cabin was not behind Darky exactly behind Darky Knob. It was no on back. On, on because the old grade is on back behind Darky Holler. Okay. So it actually would be the mountain behind. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say I uh, remember you saying something like that. Yeah. It's behind there. Yeah. I was up there. It's been. 20 years ago, I walked back up there, just walked around, and I wanted to see how high it was up on that mountain like he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very high. And I walked back through there, and there is a few old rocks back there where the old house was, the old shanty. And if you notice, if you go back in there, you'll find the old gray children back up there. That's how they used to get the logs out on trains. Yeah. 
and I didn't see no tracks or anything. Of course, I'm no, sorry. No, the tracks has been gone for years. Yeah. They took some of the tracks, and then some of the tracks people went in and took them out from scrap barn and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, that sounds spelled right. When <laughs> yeah. I was a kid, I was uh, about eight, nine years old. We used to go out and close the mountain there. And my dad and uncle had a cat meal out in there. And you could see the old ties yet that was still in there then, but you don't see them no more. Oh, wow. They brought it up over the years. I figure how many that's been over 100 years ago. Well, yeah, it's been, I didn't even know nothing that there was until you mentioned that there was, yep. it, yeah. Yeah, they used to train their logs out there and take them home out and then they'd ship them, some of them went on down, they floated some of them down the river, you know, when the water was up, they'd float them down the river and float them into Roldberg and then load them onto the bigger trains and haul them out. That is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, but Black Moon Flats connects with, um, uh, Darky Knob. Now there was like a, I don't know, it was a long or somebody. So they said that helped with the slaves escaping. I don't know if you heard anything about that or. I never heard anything about that. Yeah. But no. they was, they was a, a family lived back here who took care of the timber cutters and all that stuff, you know. And that's the ones that would, I don't know what their names was, but that's the ones that helped get the slaves onto the train, get them out of here. Oh wow. Yeah. And, and you said we, talk, we were talking about uh, Fred Long. You say he lived down. When you first turn in that White House there, it's got that big silo and barn there beside the road. Yeah. That was Fred Long. With Ansel's account of Jenny Walker and Mr. Arnold's mention of the Walker clan, who were these Tucker County Walkers? So who were the Tucker County Walkers? In my research, I can only find at least five black families residing in Tucker County in 1860, many of whom took their last names of Parsons or Crofton. It was customary to take the last name of your former slave owner, as many freed slaves needed a last name to go with their first. Digging deeper, I found in an 1870 census a Lamel Walker, age 26, and a Catherine Walker, age 68, both black and living in the Black Fork District at the time. Later I found that this Lamel Walker married a Rachel Ann Parsons who gave birth to at least six children in Tucker County. Later I found that Rachel Walker died January 11, 1908 in Hamilton, West Virginia at age 50 of heart failure and as for Lamel Walker, no death record was found. What birth and death records I can find out on these children are as follows. Mary Grace was born March the 15th, 1870 and died January the 1st, 1939 in Taylor, West Virginia at age 68 and was married to a Joseph Stokes. John Rush was born March the 15th 1874 at Blackman Flats and died March the 3rd, 1942 at age 72 of a cerebral hemorrhage in Tucker County and was never married. Wayne was born December the 16th, 1889 in Parsons, West Virginia and died on September the 2nd, 1945 at age 55 of a hemorrhage and worked as a coal miner. He also never married. John Simon was born in March 1874 with a day unknown and I could not find his death record. Squire E. Walker died December the 2nd, 1894, at only two years of age. And finally, Jeanette Walker was born September 1871 in Tucker County with no death recorded. Is this Jeanette Walker the Jenny Walker mentioned in Fansler's history of Tucker County? After doing my research and having Mr. Arnold's take on the legend, one might conclude that there was a family that would move slaves to a cabin hit at Darky Knob, so the slaves could take the logging train to Pennsylvania. And just maybe this Jenny Walker, or Jeanette Walker, was trying to escape with a child in her arms to get to a better, safer place. But fate had a different idea, and thus the legend of Darky, or Darky Schnob, was born. This we may never know, but the one thing we can say is that this legend is now part of our history. 
the history of this great place we call home.